Welcome to Eco Ask Why, a podcast that dives into industrial manufacturing topics and spotlights the heroes that keep America running. I'm your host, Chris Granger, and on this podcast, we do not cover the latest features and benefits on products that come to market. Instead, we focus on advice and insight from the top minds of industry because people and ideas will be how America remains number one in manufacturing in the world. Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today we're going to be digging into a fun topic of arc flash studies. Why are they important? What do I do with the information? And, and ultimately, how do you get started? So with us today, we have an expert, Mr. Dan Lehman from Eaton, who is joining us. And Dan has a lot of knowledge in this space, and we're really looking forward to, to unpacking this topic with Dan. So Dan, can you start us off by explaining what an arc flash study is? I can. I I don't know about expert. There are actual experts that uh, that do this for a living uh, out within our industry, who would probably take exception to the term expert when describing me. But that's okay. I can I can definitely offer a little bit of knowledge here. So an arc flash study. So we need to understand what dangers exist within our uh, within our electrical equipment. So we need to understand shock hazards which are defined as limited approach and restricted approach boundaries. And then we also have to understand the arc flash hazard associated with that. So an arc flash study is really a holistic look at the electrical system in the power flow and the power chain. So we have everything. We need to kind of know everything from, from the utility, from the utility that's feeding the, uh, the building all the way through the, main power transformers all the way down to the local piece of equipment of which we're, you know, of which we want to analyze. So the arc flash study uh, would typically come with, we we would typically learn a little bit about the voltage classes, the incident energy, which we can talk a little bit more about, but that's basically measured in calories per centimeter squared which is the arc energy at a certain distance, the limited approach distances. And then it also kind of helps us understand what personal protective equipment we might need to to have when working in and around that equipment. Okay. Well, let's, let's kind of go a little bit deeper here. What type of information do we need to even get started with that arc flash study? Sure. Yeah. So there's a lot that goes into it. And again, there's a lot of very, very smart people in this world that do this for a living and they're just incredibly talented people. But we would like to understand the transformer information. I think that's that's one of the biggest sources of the energy that would propagate down to an arc. I mean, maybe it would be a good point to just discuss what an arc is is very briefly but you know there's a couple different kinds of of faults that you can have a bolted fault would be in in your electrical system where like maybe you or the contractor terminated a phase on b phase on a breaker and that created like a bolted fault and the breaker would trip and and we you know everything would would clear that fault and they would fix it maybe they bolted inadvertently ran a bolt between a, a piece of bus bar and ground that again would be considered like a bolted fault and it would be pretty easily detected through some testing and then it would be able to get fixed. So imagine that same type of thing. Imagine a strand of wire coming off of a phase was not fully in the lug of that breaker and it was just maybe touching B phase. So one strand, as opposed to the whole cable, one strand was was straggling and got too close to an opposite phase. That, when energized, would completely burn away that strand, typically. That strand of copper or aluminum would burn away. And depending on the energy in the transformer, depending on some other factors that we'll talk about, that strand will could propagate an arc and and basically start off a, an arc event that would then just hang there and and, and continue burning until an upstream uh, protective device clears the fault. So that's generally what the arc is. The arc flash study 
will try to determine how much energy that arc could have and what damage it could do and what injuries could be sustained if that arc propagates for the duration of time until the upstream device clears that fault. It's a lot of a lot of terms there. But anyway, so back to your question, transformer information, because that's going to tell us how much current is going to try to fall into that fault. We need to understand cable runs off that transformer or bus sizing off that transformer on the secondary side. What what size cable? How far is it going? Because all of that adds what's called impedance to the system, which could help do some limiting of that of that fault. And then we also have to understand the short circuit protected device that's within that system that's going to be protecting that run. And with those three things, you can you can be dangerous enough to really kind of understand the potential arc energy at the at the actual load. Okay. So for those three things, is that typically found in a one line? Is that what would be preferred to have up front to, for the individuals that will be doing the arc flash study? Absolutely. So a one line is going to be able to give us, assuming it's updated now, is going to be able to give us the most accurate assessment of the system. On one lines, we, we are typically given cable size, how many per phase, and we're given approximate conduit run lengths. We're given transformer information. We're giving we're given transformer impedance information, typically, and we're going to figure out where the short circuit protection is within the system. So, uh, one line is great, but doing some site walks and having our power system engineers actually go to site and assess the system and look at the condition of the equipment and verify is also uh, a great way to make sure that your arc study is accurate. Okay. Now, for the users out there that may be listening that that don't have a one line, and that that is, you know, that's not uncommon. Right. W- what does their path look like? So, I think that would be started with maybe just a a conversation with with us, and we can then set up uh, what we call a site walk, and we would have a power system engineer come and spend a day depending on the size of the facility, and just kind of start documenting what they're seeing. Now, they're not going to necessarily be able to get all of the cable information, but they can make some assumptions. And, you know, any good engineer will give you a good tolerance band and will document their assumptions. And that's what then that's what we end up doing in that case. We, If we see a 1200 amp breaker, we will assume NEC cable sizing if we can't validate it visually. Typically, transformer information is going to be right there on the nameplate of the transformer, and everything that they would need to know is typically right there. There's the percent impedance, which is what they would need to, you know, part of what they would need, the voltage class, the voltage, the high voltage and low voltage side. They would have that information. So there's a lot that we would collect just by doing a site walk. And that's what I would recommend for those facilities that don't have a one line. We can just come out and, and collect data. Every manufacturer, not not just ours, but will create that one line. So that's going to be part of the output, typically, of an arc flash study as well. Is not just understanding your local arc hazards at each piece of equipment, but also be able to be given a holistic one line for the facility. Absolutely, and that that in itself brings a ton of value i mean just having that information available is something highly recommended so when you think about a facility out there in industry right now who typically owns the process of you know setting up managing the 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 arc flash studies all that information coordination is that a safety department is that electrical department what what have you seen with your experience over the years of, of the actual the ownership on the end user standpoint no, that's a great question. I, I've seen I've seen a mixed bag. So if we have a property management company out there that is managing multiple facilities for a end user, we'll typically see requests for arc flash studies and updated arc flash studies coming from them. There are certain instances where we'll actually, you know, see the actual building owner providing us that information. And even still, uh, a lot of our arc flash studies come with new construction. 
you know, so because it's now being specified in with new construction and these are now part of the bid packages, we are going and finding that electrical contractors are contacting us and, and having us do these studies uh, right when the gear gets set, because that's honestly when we're going to have the most accurate information in the system anyway. We do see some safety departments reaching out, but I would say outside of what I just mentioned, most of ours is coming from maintenance groups. So the maintenance teams understand that they're required to have studies done per OSHA and NEC every five years. And many of them are savvy as savvy individuals and groups, and they they reach out proactively to try to get those studies done to stay compliant. Okay. And you've mentioned five years a couple of times now. So is that the standard that, that industrial end users should, should stick with for the, for the arc flash studies? Yes. Yeah. That's the recommended time. It's a reasonable number. I would say it allows for you to change your system over time, but it doesn't let it go too far down the road with too many capital investments in your facility before we stop and reassess what we have. Now, you know, in order to stay compliant with new installations in an existing facility, those new installations should come with an arc flash study and a short circuit protection study. That's, again, because it's new and it needs to comply with the latest code when it gets installed. But as far as existing infrastructure, it'd be good practice to just get on the bandwagon, bite the bullet, get one done, and then you won't have to touch it for another five years unless you add equipment. Gotcha. Gotcha. Now let, let's put our, our 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 hat on that we're that end user right now. And we just had that arc flash study done and we got all this information back to us. We're feeling pretty pumped up. You know, we we did something good. We we got it approved. What should they do with that information to actually make it meaningful and 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 you know from a safety standpoint, just from an awareness standpoint, to uh to move it forward in the plant? Sure. So I mean I could I could speak of a specific example that I have of where an end user had a study done and this, it was at a chemical plant in uh, North Carolina. And that study showed that the incident energy uh, that was downstream of the main was at approximately 40 calories. It was a little bit less. It was about 30 calories per centimeter squared. That was the arc incident energy that, that was found during the, during the arc flash study. And what it actually brought out was that this facility, which touted its personnel safety, its focus on safe, safe work practices, its compliance with NEC and OSHA, you know, they were proactive. They went out to have this study done proactively. But what it found, what it, what it revealed was that All of their maintenance guys, all of their maintenance team did not have the appropriate level of PPE to be doing any sort of maintenance on the equipment. They were walking uh, around doing maintenance, thinking they were fine wearing their uh, what we would call like FR2 flame resistant 2, which is about an eight calorie per centimeter squared protection clothing when in fact they were being exposed to much higher energy levels than that. And so it, 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 it brought out the fact that they were, uh, that they that their employees were at a higher risk because they didn't have the right equipment, but it also gave them justification to go out and do two things. One, get more equipment right away because PPE, although we think of that as like the, the, the sign of safety, it's actually, the last line of defense for personnel safety. It's it's the last thing that we do to keep people safe is make them wear stuff. It relies on them wearing it properly and maintaining it properly. So it's not exactly the best solution. The best solution is, so they did that. They, they, they reactively bought new PPE that complied with their labels and with their study. But then what they also did, which is the, proactive part is they went and they started looking at how they can reduce the arc energy downstream of their distribution equipment. And that was where, you know, we were able to kind of come in and work on some solutions with them uh, to help bring that arc energy down. And so, 
you know, that's that's kind of what the purpose of this is. It's not just to get a label. Everybody just talks about just getting a sticker or a label on their equipment, but it really has some valuable information that helps them justify doing work, outsourcing work, or remediating these hazards. And so that's that's what we should be looking at as value here. Absolutely. That was a great story where that PPE was found. So just in there, I mean, what, a, what a, that should be celebrated. I mean, we, we've increased the, the people's safety that's working on it. We've also seen instances where equipment is identified with extremely high ratings. You know, where would the user start with evaluating, you know, how to re- reduce, you know, that rating or, or to make that area safer? I mean, I know this can go into many different you know, rabbit holes here, but just any general rules of thumbs of what they could do or who they should tr- to reach out to for advice in these applications? Yeah, that, that is tough. Now, uh, many times an arc is an arc incident energy doesn't just come out of thin air. That incident energy has, has been there since the equipment was engineered and installed the first time. So many times the arc incident energy that you would have anywhere in your system is inherent to the system. It's the size of the transformer that was selected with the type of protective device downstream from it with the, you know, the engineered amount and size of cables. All of it comes from the engineers who have designed the system. So as far as local remediation goes, there's really not much that can be done to an existing design. It it kind of is what it is. So we need to understand first how to keep people safe. So approach boundaries, arc boundaries, PPE. Okay. Administrative controls. Okay. So we got that. So proper labeling in the electrical room, perhaps maybe some, some radial floor tape that, that kind of keeps, gives people a visual control to, to not cross a boundary. But then really the only way to start a remediation plan on, on high incident energies would be to, to contact, uh, you know, you guys, us, and, and, and let us kind of come in and, and derive solutions. We have a lot of solutions on how we can reduce energy, but it typically would require an update to the electrical infrastructure. It might be the incorporation of limiting fuse, current limiting fuses. It may be changing transformers. It may be looking at ways that we can add impedance to an existing system. There's products that we have that can that can be installed and 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 incorporated into the system to mitigate high energies. But really it, it kind of starts with just reaching out to you guys and uh, and us and letting us just kind of come and, and analyze your system for the best solution. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, you you mentioned something there. I wanted to just back up one second because everybody does think of the the stickers, but you mentioned a radial boundary. So are you talking about that on the floor to kind of give that visual for that for that boundary itself? Sure. I've seen that. So I've seen facilities that like to put floor tape in front of electrical equipment or paint in front of electrical equipment for the three foot boundary. So that three feet uh, it's actually, I think, slightly more than three feet per code, but it's it's a it's a it's an aisle way in front of electrical equipment that we're not supposed to store anything. Okay, we're not supposed to put a cart in front of an electrical panel. We're not supposed to put somebody's desk in front of an electrical panel. So there's like a threat, and that and that by the way goes to even in your garage. I just want to say, at your house, you should not be storing stuff in front of your electrical panel. Side note, but. I've seen that. I've seen floor tape as a a means to do that. I've also seen in some larger facilities where they are defining on the floor with tape the limited approach boundary. Maybe not all the boundaries, so maybe not restricted approach. They're defining either the arc or the limited approach boundary, whichever is furthest, to keep unqualified people from crossing that boundary. Now, I will say in some instances that Uh, Arc boundary or limited approach boundary can be over over 10 feet. I've seen them 18 feet, 20 feet. Okay, so it may not be practical to do that. But in facilities where you can where it's reasonable, that's 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 a great visual control to keep people outside of that boundary. 
Absolutely. And that's something I haven't seen that often, but I think it's a, a great be- uh, tip and best practice that I wanted to bring up. And then, and when we finish this episode, I got to go do some rearranging in my garage, but I'll save that for later. <laughs> but uh, so how about, uh, in, you know, you have a lot of experience, Dan, as we mentioned, any, any real, uh, real world stories or cases that you'd want to point out from some things you, you or your team have encountered while doing art flash studies? Yeah. Yeah, sure. I, I've seen a couple of instances where people, qualified people, will be doing work inside of a arc boundary. And that's based on the study that was done. So we now know what you need to wear uh, as far as PPE when you're doing work inside of the arc protection boundary. And, you know, I've personally seen multiple people within the arc boundary when bus is exposed and I've seen people having varying levels of PPE on. So I guess I'll start with the good side. I've seen, I've seen some facilities where they're working inside of an arc protection boundary and there's exposed bus and everybody is a hundred percent perfectly compliant and suited up and, and meeting not only the intent of the rules, but keeping themselves safe. I've seen it. I've also, as I mentioned, kind of seen the other side where there'll be one person wearing some gloves, another person wearing shorts and a t-shirt, and another person wearing a 40 calorie suit. And all I'll say is that the PPE is there to protect you as a last line of defense. And so if you're standing next to somebody who's fully suited up in in a arc rated 40 calorie suit and you're not, that should be a question that you're asking yourself. You should be taking a step back and saying, maybe I shouldn't be here. And, you know, you can't wait for somebody else to tell you what you should and should not be doing to keep yourself safe. Everybody's got their own responsibilities. And so you should be recognizing that, that these hazards are real the studies prove that they're real, and we should understand those PPE and boundary requirements before going up and, and, and sticking our flashlights inside this equipment to, to check some stuff out. Absolutely. Absolutely. That, I, I don't think you could have said it better. I mean, just so, you have to be self-aware of your surroundings and, and, and what's going on. So, Dan, if we, to, to wrap this up for us, eco asks why. We always like to get to the why. You know, uh, a short summary of why is an art flash study is important. You need to understand the hazards in front of you. And there's multiple hazards inside of an electrical room. You have to understand them. You have to understand what you do to mitigate some of the risk, which comes down on these art flash labels as perhaps PPE requirements. Um, and then you also, as a say, maybe taking a step back as a manager or a building owner or as a a facility manager, you want to make sure that the people that work for you are safe. And all of that kind of stems from understanding the entire power system, which comes with short circuit and arc flash studies. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Dan, I know you would really bring a ton of value and you did. Uh, I think our listeners they definitely understand the importance of an art flash study now, what they get, why they should do it. Uh, and definitely, you know, working with partners like yourself, we can definitely support that. So I really appreciate your time and, and the knowledge that you, you shared with us today, Dan. All right. Thank you, guy. Thank you for listening to Eco Ask Why. This show is supported ad free by Electrical Equipment Company. Eco is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit ecosy.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S-W-H-Y.com.